I just want to begin by thanking uh, all of you who uh, helped with Vacation Bible School in any way. We had a great bunch of children here this week, a great bunch of adults uh, working behind the scenes directly with the kids, a great bunch of youth volunteering, and uh, some little lives were changed this week. And uh, we had one young lady who trusted Christ at Bible School come forward this morning with her whole family uh, in the second service. So I appreciate it. That's why we do Bible School is, is to, to help change lives uh, for the name of Christ. We continue our series on the family uh, today, again focused on husbands and wives, uh, another purpose that God has for your marriage. I remind you if you missed any and you want to catch up, uh, you can contact the office for a CD or you can now watch uh, the past sermons online. Go to Facebook or uh, YouTube and you can connect there and watch them. But we're focused again on marriage. And, and so I decided, you know, I, I'm going to bring back one of my all-time favorite true husband and wife stories, okay? And the great thing about our church being so uh, growing and so many people coming and going is, is a lot of you have never heard it. And so it'll be like the first time for many people. But uh, good stories worth repeating. Uh, this one took place some time back. Joyce and I had gone over to uh, Dothan to Southeast Medical Center to visit somebody. We went up to one of the top floors to make a visit. When we finished, we got in the elevator to come back down. And uh, it was just Joyce and I on the elevator. And right as the doors closed, a young man got on with us. He's probably in his 30s. And uh, so time out for some background information, then we'll come back to the elevator. Otherwise, you won't understand the, the rest of the story. Prior to that day at the hospital, Joyce had started a new exercise program. And it was primarily focused on, on her legs. And her legs were extremely sore from the new exercise, especially the hamstring portion of her legs. And so for a couple of nights prior to that day at the hospital, to help relieve the soreness, I, I had I'd massaged the back of her legs to help her out. So now I go back to the elevator at the hospital. Young man gets on. For some reason, Joyce and I that day, it was kind of one of those bigger elevators, and we went to opposite corners at the back of the elevator. I don't know why. We usually stand together. We weren't mad at each other that I recall, and uh, we, we just each went to a different corner, and we, we weren't saying anything. It was just one of those quiet moments between us. And so young guy gets on the elevator, and here we are in separate corners, and I saw him when he got on. He, he ogled my wife. He, he looked her up and down. Then he turned around and he faced the doors. And for a while, it was one of those, just one of those quiet elevator rides where nobody says anything to each other. You know, and he's facing the doors and we're in our separate corners, not talking. Until all of a sudden, from the corner that Joyce is in, she says, I really need my legs rubbed right here. <laughs> I knew who she was talking about. But the other guy didn't. We, we hadn't stood together. We hadn't said a word together. And, and, uh, and I could tell he didn't know because he turned around and looked Joyce up and down like it was his lucky day. <laughs> and I, I can't believe that this lady wants me to rub her legs. Like I've hit the lottery. And so he looked her up and down and, and, and the look he gave her said to me, baby, I'll rub your legs. <laughs> and I thought he was about to volunteer. And so I hurried over to her corner of the elevator. <laughs> And I put my arm around her and I said, Honey, I'll rub your legs again as soon as we get home. I wish I had a camera. You should have seen his face. It was like surprise and disappointment and embarrassment all at the same time. And I've never in my life seen anybody exit an elevator so fast when we got down to the bottom floor. Well, you know, not all of our married interactions are the perfect examples. And like last week, that's, that's not the greatest example in the world of perfect marital interaction to get on the elevator like you don't know each other. But now you're thinking about what I want you to think about today, which is husbands and wives. So we can go to the Bible and think about it in a deeper way. So I want you to open your, your Bible today. Find one. They're all around you. If you didn't bring one, they're under chairs all across this room. Open it to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Now, a little bit harder to find Genesis 2 than last week because you've got to turn one extra page. Anybody want to guess what page in the church Bible Genesis 2 is on? 
page two. Okay, so we're getting there. So find Genesis chapter two, verse 18. And, and this is really the story of the first marriage ever in history. And in this story is a part of God's purpose for your marriage. So Genesis chapter two, starting with verse 18. It says, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, now before we look at this, you need to know the premise I start from is that this is true. God said it. I have no problem. I, I believe God created the earth and everything in it and on it just like He said He did. So I have no problem thinking that God who supersedes science and, and medicine and, and, and all the things that, that we think are so important that He could somehow just take a rib from a man and create a woman and close it up. And I don't have a problem with that. So now if you don't believe that, you, you're probably not going to believe some of the rest of it. And by the way, if, if you don't know, if you get to pick and choose what's true in the Bible, how do you know the cross part is true? How do you know the resurrection part is true? How do you know the parts about heaven are true? So I'm just telling you, as I start, I believe it just like it was written. And I believe it reveals another purpose for your marriage. Last week, the purpose we saw was that, that together... As, as creatures who both reflect the image of God, when a man and woman come together in marriage, they have the ability to, to, to more clearly, jointly reflect the image of God. So that's one purpose, is to reflect the image of God. The purpose today in this is to complete each other. I, I, I hope it won't surprise you if I tell you that you're not perfect. And you're not yet who God wants you to be. We all need a little bit of completing a little bit of helping, a little bit of, of companionship. Genesis 1 contains the overarching view of creation. And in Genesis 1, there is mention of uh, man and woman. But in Genesis 2, some specifics about the creation of woman are given that are not in chapter 1. In verse 18, uh, it came about as God said, hey... Creation's not finished yet. It's not good for man to be alone. I'm not done. Adam needs somebody with him. Well, you see, God knew it wasn't over, but Adam did not yet realize that something was missing in his life. And I think in the next two verses, verse 19 and 20, God used a, a remarkable, unique way to help Adam come to the realization that he needed a mate. It says that God... God gave Adam the task of naming all the, all the birds of the air and, and the beasts of the field. And so he had them parade past Adam, male and female, and Adam got to give them all a name. Now I wonder if it happens something like this. If the two animals come by and Adam says, I'm going to call those animals deer. And, and that male deer is a buck and that female deer is a doe. And that's, that's a... Male and female horse. And that's a male and a female eagle. And that's a male and a female lion. And on and on it went until finally he'd given them all names. Now you know what I think happened? I think by the time he got finished giving all these animals names, Adam realized something. Every creature on earth has a partner but me. They all come by and he names them all. I think... Adam says, hmm, every creature God made has a companion except me. And so then Adam is ready for a mate. He wants, he wants what all the other creatures have. 
And so it says in, in verses 21 and 22, God makes him a mate. He creates woman. Verses 23 and 24, he brings them together in the very first marriage. And what was part of the marriage? It was God's purpose for bringing them together, making Eve was, was to be helpers to each other, to be completers. You know what? That purpose still exists for your marriage today. You're, you're not married by accident. It doesn't matter how you got married, where you got married. You're married in the eyes of God. He says a part of your purpose for your marriage should be to complete each other. To provide strength in some ways where your spouse is weak and to allow them to, to do the same for you. I think we complete each other in many ways. We didn't read chapter 1. But in chapter 1, God, God gives a way to Adam and Eve that they can complete each other. He says, hey, I want you two to have some kids. I want you to have some children. Want you, Adam and Eve, to be fruitful and multiply. Well, see, there has to be a completing of each other for that to happen because Adam can't do it by himself. Eve can't do it by herself. There has to be a, a, a reproductive completion going on for them to fulfill this mission. And, and by the way, young people living in a world that tells you that, that same-sex relationships are okay and it's just a... Uh, an alternate lifestyle. This is another example of why that's not true. Because, because two women together cannot achieve the purpose of completion. And, and two women together cannot achieve this, this purpose of, of having children. It, it takes a man and a woman to complete each other for that to happen. Single adults, I don't want you to feel left out. I don't want you to think, wow, I don't have kids and I'm a single adult. I'm not complete. That's not true. If God blessed you with the gift of being single, then you have a role model for being single. A single man with no children who perfectly fulfilled God's purpose for his life. His name was Jesus. So you know what, single folks? Devote yourself to God's glory in your life and you'll fulfill his purpose. But couples... If, if you're meant to be married, if you are married, God says a part of your purpose for coming together is to complete each other. And, and I think the possibilities on how spouses can complete each other in big ways and small ways are, are, are almost limitless because you're unique and your spouse is unique and God brings these two unique people together in a marriage that has slightly different uh, plans for it. And, and the ways that you can complete each other are almost limitless. You know, as I prepared this, I, I, I sat down and I thought, you know, God has, given, God has given me a wife to complete me. And I need to be able to articulate some ways that my spouse completes me. And Joyce completes me in many ways. You know, one way is, is she has a different personality than I do. I need her personality. I am boring. And I'm dull. And I'm an introvert. And she's an extrovert. And she's a lot of fun. And she challenges me to come out of my shell with people and to be more outgoing. I need that. Besides, what would I tell you? I rode the elevator with a guy and he didn't speak and that was it. How fun would that be? She, she challenges me with, with her outlook on life that her glass is usually half full. If I'm not careful, mine's usually half empty. And, and the completer in her what I need is to challenge me that mine's not always half empty. I need that. She challenges me probably the most important way spiritually. I mean, I've learned from her spiritually. I know I'm the pastor, but I've learned from her because she has different spiritual gifts than I do. She sees things and understands things differently than I do. I've learned about God's, uh, God's love for people Not the outside of them, but the inside of them. Because she challenges me more to see people that way. I've learned about church. I mean, I'm the pastor for 30 years, but I learned about church in a lot of ways from her. That, that it, it, it shouldn't be a place of, 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 of judgment. God's the judge, not the people. We shouldn't base it on what people come in here wearing. That God sees the heart and not, not the outside. 
I've learned from her there's a lot of different music that can lead us to praise and worship God. And it doesn't always have to be my old favorite hymns. You know? That stretches me. That, that helps complete me. I've learned from her to, to listen more carefully to the Holy Spirit. And, and she, she has spiritual discernment in some ways that I don't have. And I'm challenged to, to learn and to be more complete by, by understanding more deeply the Holy Spirit is a reliable help for understanding situations and for having insight into people and things. She challenges me. I'm a natural warrior. She challenges me. Focus more on things of eternal importance and worry less about things that don't have any eternal significance. That's a spiritual lesson that says focus on people. Because you are the eternal because you have the Spirit of God in you. You're going to live somewhere forever. So, you know, I, I challenge you, if you've never thought of how, how, how did God mean for you to complete your spouse and how are you allowing them to complete you? If you've never thought of that, I challenge you, sit down, make some notes. Think about it. Because one of the purposes for God giving you your spouse is to complete you. You ought to be able to articulate some ways that your spouse does that. But you know what I've observed in a lot of marriages, and still are sometimes because we're not perfect, is that God's purpose is completion, but there's a lot of competition that goes on in marriage. Instead of completing each other, we compete with each other. And how do we do that? Because I want you to be more like me. See, instead of appreciating the differences that God meant to strengthen our weaknesses and to complement us and to grow us, we fight over the differences. Because I want you to be more like me. And earlier in our marriage, before I think both of us learned a little bit more about completing each other, we spent more time competing. And I was determined, she's going to be more like me. Okay? There were ways that drove me crazy. I, the, the one that probably stands out the most is how could, a, how could an intelligent adult woman never know where her keys, her purse, or her phone are located? How does that happen? To me, it's simple, see? You put them in the same place every time you get home, and they'll be there when you want them. See, that's how I think. So when I get home, I put my wallet in the same place. I, put, I take my watch off. I put it in the same place. I put my keys in the same place. I'm going to make you like me. <laughs> Nothing I tried worked. I put hooks on the walls at every place we were. Laundry room, entrance. Hang your keys here. Big signs. Hang your purse here. Here's a great place for your phone. Nothing worked. Why? Because God didn't make her like me. And that's not wrong. That's just different. See, and what I began to realize is that her mind goes places mine doesn't. Her mind is a whir of, of ideas and creativity and, and, and that kind of thing. And I'm thinking about where am I going to put my wallet? See, I don't even know if where to put those things is on her list. I don't know if she has a list. <laughs> so one of the things I've realized, in this little small way that seems insignificant, I can help complete her by just helping her know where they're at. Instead of harassing her and fighting with her about it and trying to make her like me, I can accept who she is and I can see, well, how can I complete her? In that way. You know what I do now most days? I lay her keys and her purse and her cell phone on the countertop before I leave. So she can find them. Well, uh, I do it some to be noble, but some at selfish reasons. Because I don't like her calling me at the office and saying, come home because I can't find my keys. <laughs> so there's, I'm being honest. But, but you see, that's a little thing. Let me tell you a deep truth about little things. If you find enough little ways to complete your spouse... Before you know it, it'll make a big difference. 
You don't have to find the, the one way that's going to make it. Because there's not one way. There's a lot of ways. The more of those little ways you find to, to, to complete your spouse and let them complete you, the more you'll have the marriage you're looking for. But the more you compete over those differences, the more you will disrupt God's plan of completion. Because competition and completion don't go together in this context. So I would challenge you, married folks, how are you doing with this? What's your marriage like? Is it a marriage of completion or competition? Are you looking to change that person to be more like you? Or are you looking just to, to accept them and if they need to be changed, let God change them? Let me tell you something. The only person you have any hope of changing is you. You are the only person that you can let God change. And if we would spend more time in our marriages letting God change us and trusting the change of the other person into His hands and just finding out how we could complete them, how much better would our marriages be?